and welcome to my channel. Bonsoir et bienvenue sur ma chaîne. My name is Miro and this evening, well, it's time for another monthly reading wrap-up. The month of April was insane because I read a grand total of 15 books. Now, granted, four of those were graphic novels and I seriously don't, well, no, I know for a fact May won't be as uh, productive. But in any case, I also participated in my first ever readathon and I completed it. It was the 2020 Owls Magical Readathon and I passed all my owls, so I'm proud of that, I suppose. And this month, I also started my big reread of all my Chronicles of Pern books. I'm halfway through, I read four of them, and I have four left, which I will be reading in the month of May. But first, I have to start with the two books that basically straddled the end of the month of March and beginning of the month of April, which were The Forgotten Beasts of Eld by Patricia A. McKillop. I did a review for this book, if you want to check it out. It was a lovely, warm, little fantasy story with a solid and interesting main character, magical beasts, of course, and I was very happily surprised by it and really enjoyed it. And right after that, I read Stories of Your Life and Others by Ted Chang, which was a colossal disappointment. I also made a rant slash salty review for this, if you want to have a laugh. No, it was not good in my opinion. I know I'm in the small minority of people who are not fans of Ted Chang, or at least I'm not a fan so far in any case, and I'm not particularly interested in trying out his other short story collection, but maybe one day, who knows. I was expecting a science fiction short story collection, not even half of the stories were science fiction. There was a lot of religious stuff in there, which I really didn't care for. I thought a lot of the stories had, I mean, weak endings or even nonsensical endings. One of the stories I genuinely found stupid, and even the title story on which the great movie Arrival is based, well, I thought the movie was better, so that should tell you all you need to know. So yeah, major fail, but a lot of people, most people, seem to really love Te Chang, so don't let my opinion deter you from trying him out. You might get something out of it, but I certainly didn't. Then I read this novel, My Dark Vanessa by Kate Elizabeth Russell. I also did a fairly lengthy and quite personal review for this book, if you want to check that out. So everything you need to know about this will be in that review. But very briefly, this book recounts the story of the main character Vanessa Y, who had a relationship with her teacher when she was 15 years old, and the impact this relationship has had in her life. So there's a dual timeline with her experiencing the relationship when she's 15 and another in which she's 32 years old and just unpacking what this relationship has left her with, tackling allegations of sexual misconduct from former students. She doesn't feel like she's a victim of abuse, so she just has to square all that in her mind and etc, etc. So it was a good novel. I enjoyed it for very specific personal reasons, which I also go into in my review. So it's, it's a good novel. It's a bit hard to read, or at least it was a bit hard to read for me. It's not amazing writing-wise. I was there for the content, not so much the writing style, but it's a, it's a good book. It will probably start a lot of conversations, or at least I hope so, so definitely check it out. Obviously this is a literary fiction, not SFF as I usually read. And also this was one of the books I read for the Owls Readathon. This was for the Herbology prompt. You had to pick a book with the title starting with the letter M. In parallel to My Dark Vanessa, I also read Super Crash by Daryl Cunningham. This is a graphic non-fiction book talking about the 2008 financial crisis, but more specifically about what led to it and what made it possible. It's actually pretty interesting. The way this book is structured, you have three parts. One part is about Ayn, Anne Rand, I really do not know how you pronounce that first name, Anne Rand and her legacy of extreme individualism, or I would even call it selfishness and extreme liberalism, or no, maybe not liberalism, but libertarianism, specifically right-wing libertarianism. Then the second part is about the financial crisis proper, and the third part explores the differences in personality and ideology between left-wing people and right-wing people and how they approach society and how open they are or aren't 
to facts and new data about the world. Overall, I think it's a very good book. I gave it a very high rating, 8 out of 10, I think, where it's full stars on Goodreads. So it's worthwhile, if only to get a refresher on what the hell happened during the 2008 financial crisis. And the bit about Anne Rand was very, very interesting because I didn't know much about her. <laughs> what I read in that thing, I hate her. I mean, the woman's dead, so I mean, it doesn't matter anymore, but she seemed like a very, very disagreeable person, to put it very nicely. But it's interesting to see the influence she had on certain key figures which then were directly responsible for the 2008 financial crisis. So that bit was really informative and engaging. I don't know that much about economics. I would like to know more, but at the same time I'm not super interested and I'd rather read other things. So I tried to circumvent potential boredom by reading these kinds of things. Like, it's about economics, but in an indirect way, I guess. The third part was the weakest, in my opinion. I mean, it was interesting to see, like, some studies link these personality traits to people on the left, people on the right, what are the core values of people who are on the left and on the right, and it's very broadly defined, left and right. The author is British, so he has a more European-centric view to this, which is fine by me because I'm a European, but you can apply this to the United States as well. And his conclusion is basically that there isn't any real left anymore in Western slash developed countries, that even parties that call themselves leftist are still on the right, economically speaking at least, which, yeah, that does make sense. It's also a bit depressing, I mean, seeing the power of corporations and lobbyists and etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. So it's not a light read. Still, it was interesting. And on that subject, I would also highly recommend the documentary Inside Job, which was specifically about the 2008 financial crisis. It was an excellent documentary. It was very easily understandable. So if this is something that intrigues you, I would also recommend that those two things would go well together, actually. Then I took a little graphic novel interlude with, well, a reread and a new read of my two volumes of Why the Last Man. So, first volume was Unmanned and the second volume is Cycles. So, this was a reread because I'd read this in January, I think. And then I went straight into Cycles. It's still <laughs> very, very good, entertaining, engaging. Um, I mean, the first one really hooks you in. The second, I think, was a little weaker. I mean, now I just I just want to continue, but I don't have <laughs> the following volumes, but I will probably be purchasing them uh, this month or next month. I definitely want to read all of the series. It's, uh, it's very good. And then finally, I went back to Pern with Dragonflight by none other than Anne McCaffrey. So the first time I read The Chronicles of Pern, I was 12. I think, 11, 12, 13, those years. So quite a long time ago, more than 10 years ago. I remember cool features, but I'm also surprised, I don't know, but <laughs> there are a lot of things I didn't remember, which is a good thing on the one hand, because it's like I'm reading it again for the first time. But on the other, I realized that some things I don't like anymore. And I wonder, did I notice these problematic bits when I was that young? I don't think so, but I'm surprised because I convinced it would have bugged me a bit. I don't know. Anyway, interesting. A quick note, I will be doing a kind of review for my whole reread of the series. It's gonna be like a casual review, sort of what I did for The Lord of the Rings and The Silmarillion. So I won't be in depth, like I won't be reviewing every single character. But I'll look over, you know, major themes, the world building, which I, I think is the most interesting bit personally and just my overall impression and experience. But briefly, this is the very first Chronicles of Pern novel, the first one Anne McCaffrey wrote and published. It introduces you to the world of Pern, it sets the scene with some of the main characters and the main storyline, and yeah, introduces you to the dragons and the planet and the people and how society is organized. But, okay, I didn't think it was that good. <laughs> I gave it three stars on Goodreads, 6 out of 10 in my notation system. It's a good thing it's it's a starter novel, because on its own I don't think it's very good. If it's taken, you know, within the series and as, you know, the first part of like a two to three part story within the Chronicles of Pern, so this is followed by Dragon Quest, and the White Dragon I think is kind of a follow-up 
to Dragonflight and Dragon Quest, but I haven't read that one yet. With Dragon Quest, it's a lot better, and I think Dragon Quest is a lot better, but I'll get back to that in a second. I don't think it was that good. There's some problematic bits with the relationship of the main female character and the main male character, and I don't know, characterization just felt a bit dated. In certain places it felt like old science fiction, and not in a good way, if you know what I mean, and just not that much information given on the world overall, but that's, I mean, I do remember that it gets explained a lot more in following novels, so it's not that big of a problem knowing that, which is why I said within the context of the whole series it's fine, but on its own it's a bit weak, I think. But the dragons are amazing though, <laughs> I mean, that's the main draw, and that's what I thought was so cool when I was young, I was like, oh it's dragons, but in a science fiction setting, Oh, this is so neat! I'll get more into it with the other novels I'm going to mention and with my casual review I'll be doing at the end of, uh, well, this month. I forgot to add, so that novel also counted as my um, book for the Dragon Tamer prompt for the Owls Readathon. But with that I also read another non-fiction book, in French this time, Sorcière by Mona Cholet. So this year I'm going to have a few uh, French language non-fiction books. Like I've said, I think, in a few other videos, I really don't read much French fiction, but I often find interesting titles of non-fiction. If you don't know French, sorcière means witches, and this book is about witches in the context of feminism, so it's more looking at the archetype of the witch and the legacy of the witch hunts and witch trials of late medieval early renaissance Europe. And so looking at the archetype of the witch, not lonely but the lone woman, the independent woman, often childless, manless, you know, celibate, or not celibate but I mean uh, not in a relationship with familiars and knowledgeable about medicine, plants, contraception, things like that, and then linking those aspects of the witch archetype to feminist discussions, quite simply. So there are four parts, a part about the independent woman, the woman who doesn't depend on a husband or even a boyfriend, who is content on her own and enriches herself on her own, in her own company. Doesn't mean she rejects friends or loving relationships, but she stands strong by her own merits. Then there's a part about childlessness and being child-free as well. So, you know, examining the pressures women experience about maternity and being pressured about having children. But then also, very fairly, addressing the pressures women who do have children experience. Basically pointing out that you can't win in this. If you don't have children, you're selfish, cold, a bitch, basically. But if you do have children, you better be the best mother on earth and be a perfect human being, basically. So either way, you can experience a crap ton of stress. And the third part is about old age, because of course the witch is often depicted as, you know, the crone, the old woman, the old wizened woman, or the old wise woman. <laughs> so old age, how women become invisible with age, are belittled, are demeaned, and the endless pursuit of youth, youthfulness, or more specifically, youthful appearance. I mean, she even talks about, like, age gap relationships, like, it's sort of, bear with me, accepted, like, for an older guy to have, like, a younger wife, but a woman who does the same is judged more harshly. She, she says that, you know, like, all the women who have younger boyfriends or younger partners are called cougars. There's no equivalent term for a man. She goes in depth, is my point. She, there are lots of like little threads that connect together around these four parts. The last part, now I thought it was going to be about ecofeminism a bit, but not that directly. It does talk about science and the commodification of nature, which parallels the commodification of the female body and of female labor, and how a certain view of science has allowed human beings to disconnect themselves from nature and exploit it and rationalize their abuse of the natural world, which I overall agree with. It also takes a look at medicine in particular and, uh, well, gynecology, which, <laughs> let's be real here, it's a few skeletons in its closet and despite its <laughs> focus has been quite misogynistic in the past, 
because it was practiced by men for a long time and not always the nicest of men. So that was a very interesting chapter, very important chapter, I think, really taking a look also at the relationship between patient and doctor and how that can parallel patriarchal oppression or even, you know, like um, race-based oppression, things like that. Just systems of dominance that interconnect. Overall, this book was excellent. <laughs> it was an excellent essay. I mean, this is technically an essay, I guess. Though, like I said, she does give a, a history of like the witch trials, which was fascinating and is very in-depth. Like I said, you have these four main chapters with those four main themes, but then it goes into so many different little details. And I liked it because those themes, I guess, were a bit more, maybe not taboo. They definitely have been explored by feminism, but they might not be front and center of what most people think when they think of feminism, like, you know, equal pay for equal work, or abortion rights, or things like that, like talking about the, not the right, but the validity of not wanting children and perhaps not even wanting anything to do with children. Doesn't mean you want to hurt children, of course, but just children are not part of your life plans. Talking about being happy on your own. I think that's very taboo in a way, because I think mainstream feminism will perhaps say, you know, you have to work to be equal to the man in your relationship. But what if you don't even want to be in a relationship? I mean, you can be in a relationship, but perhaps not in the traditional romantic sense. That gives lots of avenues of thought for things like relationship anarchy, polyamory, things like that. Old age, of course, which is something no one really wants to think about, which is understandable. No one wants to get old, neither men nor women. I mean, and she does, she acknowledges, you know, men also face prejudice from old age, but not to the same degree as women. The last bit about medicine, I think that's actually coming more and more to the forefront, talking about female medicine and the abysmal lack of data on female specific medical conditions and also medical abuse towards women, also people of colour as well, and the little tie-in to what I would call ecofeminism. That is probably becoming more and more relevant since, you know, the discussion about climate change. This book was great. Honestly, near flawless. I gave it a 9 out of 10. The only thing that annoyed me just a bit, like the first three parts were basically perfect, but one little thing rubbed me the wrong way, I guess, in the last part. Like I said, I generally agree with her opinion of a certain way of doing science. I don't think the scientific method is what's wrong here. It's the people using the scientific method, because people are biased oftentimes, not always. The ideal is to not be biased when you conduct research. And she does acknowledge that, but at one point I was like, ooh, you're getting really dangerously close to sounding like you're a bit anti-science in a way, anti-Western medicine. Now, I'm the first one to criticize science and Western medicine, because everything deserves to be criticized slash critiqued. But I don't reject it, right? There are lots of good things that come out of science, and medicine, I'm always the first one also to say that people should have better basic scientific education in school. So the power is in their own hands. See, what she's talking about is an abuse of power by experts. But the way she phrases it almost sounds like, well, you know, don't trust doctors because they'll abuse you. She doesn't outright say that because she says, I'm very grateful to all the good doctors I've had and who've been amazing and helped me. But I thought she wasn't thorough enough in uh, stressing the nuance between rejecting the people who abuse the scientific method and called rationality and the scientific method itself or rationality. Otherwise, I wouldn't read, if you speak French and read French, I would highly, highly recommend this book. It's very good. And again, I forgot to mention that book was also read for the Owl's Magical Readathon. It was for History of Magic. You had to read a book about witches or featuring witch characters, but in my case, I mean, yeah, freaking witches in the titles would <laughs> fit perfectly. But then that was followed by another graphic novel interlude. So I reread. Sex Criminals Volume 1, and I followed with Sex Criminals Volume 2. A quick reminder, this series is about two people, a man and a woman, they meet, and they can both freeze time each time they have an orgasm. And based on that, they decide that they're gonna rob a bank to help the woman raise money to keep her library open. So it's for a very good cause. 
and it's a very weird premise. But it's funny! I liked it. And you know what? Volume 2 was better than Volume 1. Volume 1, well, of course, again, it's the first volume, so it introduces the story, the characters. And there's lots of humour to it. Lots of humour about sex, obviously, but it, you know, lots of silly stuff. There's a lot of silly humour. And Volume 2 injected a good dose of emotion in there and, like, really character investment and relationship development. It, there was something fairly touching about it because it also talked about mental illness. I was really surprised. And it was done with overall quite a lot of finesse. It was good. It was funny, sensitive, and weird. <laughs> Because, right, people who freeze time when they have an orgasm, because that continues in volume two, and they realize there are other people on Earth with disability, and there's this woman who's an export star, who, when she has an orgasm, she becomes a shining ghost like thing. And she's become like a, a physics professor to try and figure out what's going on with her. She studies time, because time is frozen when she has an orgasm. Anyway, it's kind of crazy. I don't know. I, I, I really like it. I'm going to continue with this series. Hopefully acquire volume three soon. Continuing my adventures in Pan, I read Dragon Quest. And like I said, I thought it was better than Dragonflight. This really gets into character development and fleshing out character relationships and fleshing out the world and the events taking place in that particular time on the planet Pan. Overall, good stuff. And at the same time I read that, I also read The Gendered Brain by Gina Rippon, which was also for the Owls Readathon. This was for Charms, you needed to read a book with a primarily white cover. This is a book about, very simply, neurosexism, or the endless quest to prove intrinsic trait, character, personality, behavioural differences between men and women. It's in the same vein as Delusions of Gender, written by Cordelia Fine. And this book is written by a woman who does neuroscience research. Cordelia Fine, I think, majored in psychology. Not that there's anything wrong with that. But Gina Rippon is an actual neuro researcher. So she works with like neuroimaging and things like that. And so she talks about the gendered brain and what that actually means. Basically destroying the idea that there is a male brain and a female brain. There are, of course, brains in male and female bodies, but you can't just take a brain, plonk it out, <laughs> and say, that's a man, that's a woman. And, you know, tackling gender stereotypes. And she goes through the history of trying to find sex differences in personality. I'm not talking about, like, the, the rest of the body, the reproductive system. There are obviously differences between males and females. That's why there are males and females, right? For reproduction, you, you need some differences of the way, what's the point of having that system? But looking at, you know, the personality, the essence of an individual, she takes a look at the history, like back in the 17th century they were trying to prove that men had bigger brains, and of course, you know, trying to find these differences isn't innocent, it's to establish male superiority every single time, and, you know, keep the status quo of male dominance, etc. Up to the present day, and she talks about neuroimaging studies, and that was a really interesting bit, explaining that, like, a lot of new technologies, it goes through a phase of like everyone thinking it's gonna accomplish everything and anything, then you realize no, it doesn't actually work that way, so you have a massive trough of disappointment, and then, no not disappointment, disillusionment, and then it slowly creeps back up to an enlightened appreciation of what it can actually do and what you can actually learn from it. And I realized, you know what, the exact same thing happened with genetics. That was interesting. She comes through the research on hormones, on brain imaging, on brain anatomy, on brain connectivity, even psychological testing, showing, to make a long story short, that really there aren't any essential differences. And by that she means you're not born with like the female preset or the male preset in your brain. We're born with plastic little brains and taking very, very, very young babies, because that's the key. You cannot say, if you find differences in babies six months old, see, that proves it, because by the time you're six months, you'd be surprised the crap ton of stuff that has already happened to shape your brain, and the amount of socialization you've already absorbed. It's literally impossible to have control experiments about this, because we are dipped into a gendered social world the minute we're born, and perhaps even a little before, she explains, talking about gender reveal parties, which 
to my mind, sound incredibly stupid. <laughs> like, just showing all these things about gender socialization, how young it actually starts. How depressing that is, actually. Even talking about the fact that some things have gotten worse in the last 20 years. Apparently around the time I was born and a bit before that, gendered socialization for very young kids with toys and things like that had actually been reduced. And then it took off again, which actually does correspond to the backlash against female liberation and feminism, so it all ties in together and makes sense in that regard. To me, it's a very important subject because that's basically what made me a feminist, realizing that just because I'm a girl doesn't mean I have to like Barbie dolls and pink and crap like that. I like dinosaurs and Legos. Didn't mean I was a boy, did it? <laughs> and like I said, despite the fact it's a bit depressing showing that things have gotten a bit worse in the last 20 years with regards to like um, gendered toys and even gendered expectations on young children. That being said, the brain is plastic. And even though it loses plasticity with age, Things can be changed. Education can change a lot of things. She said that even playing video games can bring women's spatial capacities to the same level as the average male. Things like that. Talking about how we establish neural networks and we can change them. This is also actually quite encouraging for mental health. But uh, it's fascinating. It really goes in depth. It goes more in depth than delusions of gender in that respect. It just looks at so many different things that all connect together. So I was really, really happy with this read. Again, I would say it had a largely a 9 out of 10. A minor thing here and there was a bit weird. I didn't think it was necessary putting it in there. But otherwise, I shall now be recommending this book along with Delusions of Gender and Testosterone Rex as well. Then the final week of April, I read three books. I'm really happy because I finished everything just in time on the 30th to complete my uh, Owl's magical readathon. So first the fiction and well again Chronicles of Pan I read in very close succession Dragon Song and Dragon Singer. The Chronicles of Pan books take place in different times and with different characters. They don't all like a uh, linear story. That's why they're chronicles and not I guess a series. I know what I mean. <laughs> Um, so these two are actually supposed to be part of a trilogy, as I understand it. I never read Dragon Drums, which is supposed to be number three in the Harper Hall trilogy. I just read these two, and so those are the ones I reread, obviously. And they follow another character from, like, the main group you're introduced to in Dragonflight, the character of Manoli, a young woman, young girl of 15, who is a musical prodigy, basically, and... She wants to devote her life to music, but in Penny society, it's actually fairly sexist. Harpers cannot be female, and harpers have a very special place in Penny society. They are musicians, obviously, but their music has a very important social and educational function. But Manon is lucky enough to fall under the wing of her holds Harper, who really takes a strong liking to her, and he teaches her everything he knows. And she's like, well, basically abused, really, by her parents. I would call it abuse, to be honest. She's like the runt of the family. She's the youngest and no one gives a crap about her. And they do not have one minute to waste on her musical aspirations. They don't tolerate her artistic sensibilities. And it's a story. And she befriends fire lizards. And fire lizards are basically miniature dragons. But they're wild, unlike the dragons. But she befriends is and so they become her little family. They're nice little books. I also read that they're apparently supposed to be like the YA books of the Chronicles of Pern. I don't know, I mean, was that the way they were sold back in the day? Like, I feel like that's a, <laughs> a rebranding they had like in later years when YA really took off as the marketing category, so anyway. But Rereading them, yeah, I can see that it's aimed at a younger audience, not just because Manoli is younger, but the story is just very feel-good, which isn't bad. I'm just not really used to that, I guess. Same with Dragonflight and Dragon Quest. I thought Dragon Singer was better than Dragon Song. I think Dragon Song was a very simple story. Not much happens overall, actually, over 288 pages, but like the font was really big, so it's more a novella than a novel, I felt. Whereas Dragon Singer, again, has more characters, more character interactions, more character development, more events. On its own, I think this would be overall pretty weak, but together it's much better. 
So I gave this 6 out of 10 and this 7 out of 10. So it was enjoyable. I guess mostly I was really warmed by the little fire lizards. I love Lunani's relationship with the little fire lizards. They're always rubbing their little heads against her cheeks and perching on her shoulders. Well, I mean, it made me a bit sad also because it reminded me of my parrot, but um, it's it's sweet. And I mean, because you can actually exchange, not really telepathically, but you can exchange thoughts with them like you can with the big dragons. I mean, with the big dragons, you can exchange thoughts and words, but with the little ones, you can exchange feelings. So there's an empathic bond there. And uh, oh, I'd love to have a fire lizard. Like, I mean, that or a pet velociraptor are like my go-to uh, fantasy uh, non-human companions, because as much as I'd love to be a dragon rider, let's be honest, um, in the world today as it is, there's not much space for dragons. It's not very practical. But a, a fire lizard or a pet velociraptor, those are my go-tos. The final book for April was The Genius of Birds by Jennifer Ackerman, a non-fiction book about bird cognition bird intelligence, etc. And this was my final book for the Owl's Readathon. Care of Magical Creatures, you needed a book with a bird on the cover. And uh, well, yeah, I think this fits, don't you? And this was a great book. In depth, wide ranging, complete, about, well, fluffle intelligence. <laughs> like, I mean, it's pretty straightforward. I'm a bird nerd. I love me some birdies or fluffy dinosaurs, because they are dinosaurs. And this is said in this book, Birds are dinosaurs. Like, the dinosaurs didn't go extinct. They just, uh, you know, were miniaturized, became extra fluffy, and all of them became flighted. Well, not all of them, but a lot of them, most of them. And it takes a look at, you know, the latest research, I guess, in avian cognition. I mean, it's pretty recent. So, of course, you've got the stars of the show, the corvids and the parrots, at the top of the brainy pyramid. You know, the feathered apes, that's what they're called by some people, some researchers, but I agree with that, you know, uh, qualification 100%. But it also looks, you know, at other birds like sparrows, chickadees, pigeons, and, you know, makes a list of the most intelligent bird groups according to a, a test devised by researchers. And then the chapters look at a specific aspect of bird cognition. Aesthetic appreciation and skill in nest building and also the gallery building of the bower birds And then you have of course mapping abilities So it talks about migratory species, but also just mapping in general like scrub jays remember where they've stashed all the nuts Homing pigeons, how exactly do they get back to their home? You have general problem-solving abilities So that chapter is basically devoted to New Caledonian crows, which are known to make tools, which is very rare in the non-human realm. Uh, you have social relationships, how that fosters intelligence, and that's directly relevant to human beings because one of the theories of how we became so cognitively developed is because we have such complex social relationships. So talking about social groups, but also mating pairs. Some researchers argue that that's even more of a driver for bird intelligence than social structures more akin to that of primates or, you know, cetaceans. And of course, song song and communication and parrots are mentioned obviously but actually it talks more about like chickadees and mockingbirds and how very very similar the way birds learn to sing is to the way humans learn to speak even like on the dna level the same sets of genes are activated so it's it's a beautiful example of like convergent evolution that's the fascinating thing that human beings have a lot of common with like a crow or a cockatoo. And finally, there's a chapter on like adaptability, how well birds can adapt to challenging situations, new environments, and this is especially relevant because of, well, the Anthropocene and the way humans have massively modified most of the environments on planet Earth, so it talks about birds that are very good at surviving in cities, urban areas. Overall, really, really good book. I didn't quite give it a 10 out of 10 because it is in-depth, it is uh, wide-ranging, but I wanted more. I was greedy. I was just unreasonably greedy. I wanted more, I guess, some little bits I'd read in other books weren't featured quite as prominently in this one, and I wanted more, like, talk about emotions, consciousness, things like that, but it, it's a very difficult thing to talk about from a rational scientific point of view, because it's very difficult to test for. Though I will say one thing that was brought up in the book was also brought up in the book I read by Franz de Waal, which is that it's all well and good to test animals for their intelligence. You need to know how to 
design a test, you need to know what question you're asking before you seek answers. Because sometimes results don't really show a lack of ability in a species. It just shows that we're crap at designing a good test for them. And also that, you know, you should appreciate another species' cognitive capacities for their own sake. You shouldn't perhaps always seek to compare them to the humans. They're clever in their own ways. That's why she used the word genius, because she defines, well, she doesn't define, but she says one of the definitions of genius is excelling in a particular domain. It doesn't denote overall intelligence on a human scale. So that's the point. These birds, even the less humanly intelligent birds, have their own form of genius. So yes, yay for the fluffles. If you love birds, obviously read this and you probably already have. Even if you're not a bird nerd though, and you're just generally interested in science and more specifically in animal cognition, this is a very good title. And it will join my other titles on the subject of birds, bird cognition, also general animal cognition. And that wraps up a lengthy monthly reading wrap up. Like I said, I'm very satisfied I read so many books. Like, how did I do it? I don't know. The month of May will not be as productive, but it will continue my uh, revisiting of the world of Pern, and I will be reading a couple of non-fiction titles and a couple of graphic novels as well. In the meantime, I hope you're all doing well. I hope you have a brilliant day, evening, night, whichever <laughs> period suits your fancy. And I shall see you in the next video. Bye-bye.